In 1984, Universal and Lorimar presented The Last Starfighter. Greetings, Starfighter. You have been recruited by the Star League to defend the frontier against Sur and the Kodan Armada. Get ready. Prepare for blast off. I played Alex Rogan, a kid from an isolated mountain trailer park who's recruited to fight in an interstellar war when he breaks the record on a seemingly ordinary video game. Hi, I'm Lance Guest. All of us who worked on The Last Starfighter were drawn to its charming story, its witty dialogue, and its tongue-in-cheek treatment of good old-fashioned space adventure fantasy, all of which formed the base of its continuing popularity. But if there's one element that earns a distinctive place in cinema history, it's the film's groundbreaking use of computer-generated visual effects. So now, let's cross the galaxy to that war-torn planet of Rylos and hear from director Nick Castle and the rest of the artists that crossed another frontier that led to the amazing new world of digital effects technology. Long before technology enters the scene, there's always the idea, the story, and the writer. I was a junior copywriter at an advertising agency in New York, and uh, I would find myself with large blocks of time between account meetings or whatever, and uh, I, was, I, I started writing screenplays. It was funny, because one day I was on my lunch break, and uh, I kind of wandered into one of these video arcades. And I saw this young boy playing with a video game, and uh, I was, at the time, also reading The Once and Future King by White. And, you know, it suddenly occurred to me, in a bolt from the blue or whatever, what if a video game was like a sword in the stone? And the boy pulled the sword from the stone, and some boy scored an incredible uh, number on this video game, and it sent out a ripple effect across the universe. And Nick came in with about hundred ideas on what to do with the film and I was really impressed with him and I don't think I met anybody after after I met with Nick because I kind of at that point felt he was the right guy for the movie. Jonathan had said it in suburbia kind of a, a Steven Spielberg um, poltergeist even E.T. world which was I thought too derivative of those works so we looked for a different place and also a more secluded place. Suburbia seemed kind of too comfortable a background to have the boy want to evolve from but if you show a boy wanting to kind of leave a trailer park under very modest circumstances, the, the, the sympathy level, you know, you, your heart goes out to kids like that a little more. It just always made so much sense that you had a kid who felt trapped and really wanted a better life for himself and looked metaphorically to the stars. And the place we found, it had the store that was already there. It had these levels. Um, a place where Otis, the store manager and kind of the manager of the place, it seems, is, uh, lives in this little place and it's some kind of funky stairs that go down to the main uh, spread where all the, uh, all the trailers are there. And uh, so Jim, I know, did a, a lot of maneuvering of the trailers and uh, brought in a couple of things and we did a lot of dressing to give it a real sense of Americana. And the trailer park also provided, I think, the opportunity for Nick to do what he does best, which are create eccentric little characters. And and a funny little neighborhood. I'm gonna miss my soap! Oh, stop. I think you see a certain amount of the charm and schmaltz of a Hollywood musical in there um, without the music. The primary design element was, uh, was the sign. It had the Starlight, Star Bright trailer park. And while it looks a little bit like a bowling alley sign, it still, I think, had uh, a degree of resonance for the plot.
we realized that we were doing a movie about a kid that gets recruited to go fight an interstellar war, and, and if you're going to do a movie with that premise, that simple premise, you're going to run right up against Star Wars. And I think the beta unit stuff on Earth really does help the movie give its originality. Hey, you look like me. Of course I do. I'm the beta unit. What the hell's a beta unit? Alex was more serious, and the beta unit was more goofy. Now I need an ear job. Dying. The scene where I take my head off and put it on the table. I had this really funny looking wig on, and they had to make me up because I was so very, very sick for the whole week of reshoots. And uh, some of those scenes, I look really dead. Alex, what the hell is going on? Lewis, you're having a terrible nightmare. Go back to sleep. Lewis! If the technology's there to sort of take them away, then certainly they've got to have the technology to sort of see that they're not missed. It enabled us to leapfrog uh, the stories and intertwine them. Not only were you sort of uh, taken along for the ride with the beta unit down learning the trials and tribulations of being a teenager in an Earth family, but you were also intercutting that with what was going on up in, in outer space. Rylos and 20 clicks. Squadrons of deck fighters will precede the mothership. Squadrons? How many squadrons? It isn't the number of squadrons that concerns me. Lance was someone that we uh, liked right away. He was in the running as soon as we saw him and, and, and heard his first reading. He had the qualities of a young Jimmy Stewart, uh, Henry Fonda. He is also uh, the archetypal hero. And of course, at the beginning, all he really wants to do is leave the trailer park and have a, have a life outside of this little world that he grew up in and, and go to the big city. You guys think I'm going to hang out here, watch you shine your pickup, go to the drive-in, get drunk and throw up every Saturday night? Go to City College like everybody else. Forget it, man. I'm doing something with my life. And little does he know is he, the big city turns out to be the cosmos. There's only enough room up there for me, Brig, and Maggie. Me? Yeah. Catherine Mary Stewart is, in the same way, we're looking for someone to be the girl next door, perky and charming and attractive, and uh, we just loved her spirit, and also her sense of uh, uh, this wistfulness that she has and this kind of uh, underlying fear that she could project about being someone that might have to go away from her setting, which was very comfortable for her, for her to live with her granny and, and uh, help her out. A singular honor for everyone was the opportunity to work with the amazing Robert Preston in his last feature film. Action. What the? Cut. <laughs> Robert Preston was someone that I think, uh, uh, I think Jonathan Betchwell came up with that idea. And when he said, what do you think for Centauri of Robert Preston, Music Man in Outer Space. Centauri is the name. I invented Starfighter, which is why I'm here. It is? It is. We have to talk about a matter of utmost importance. Step into my office. That's it. And we just, all of us turned and went, we have to get that guy. We have to get Robert Preston. And in fact, when Jonathan came up with the idea, we started to rewrite the character. Because if you think of the Music Man, you think of Robert Preston, he talks, you know, thousand words a second. Centauri is impressed. I've seen him come and I've seen him go, but you're the best, my boy. Dazzling, light years ahead of the competition, which is why Centauri is here. You needed someone that was really gonna pull off those lines and, um, and it was just a match made in heaven. Well, there's a lot of con in Centauri. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever portrayed an outer space con man yet. Return the money, Centauri. Return the money? Are you delirious? Do you know how long it took to invent the games, to merchandise them, get them into the shops by Christmas? And he was a tremendous guy to work with, real fun. Great stories about uh, Hollywood, so I mean, it was a fun time to have him on board. He was a real trooper uh, because it was a very difficult uh, exercise in putting on the makeup. All day long, isn't it, Robert? Mm-hmm. Getting it over with. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> You're gonna I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna walk him out, yeah. Oh, go ahead it was my first film, so 
And I was a huge Music Man fan and a big fan of his and, and the character he portrayed in Music Man. And There's no more cables or anything, Price. You just have to get in the car. Uh -huh. Okay. I see I boxes. I can do this in my sleep. So working with him and getting him for the movie was a thrill, and, and he was terrific to work with, and everybody had a great time with him. And you're down in here like this, yeah. and I want to not see you, and then come up firing right at where King is. At this I point. would always try to get him to rehearse the scenes with me. Shooting camera left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the guy was in his mid 70s, and he would always say, "Hey, I'm a theater actor. I'll, I'll do it as much time, many times as you want." Action. It was amazing. He still had that great energy, and he was tremendous in the film. Phew. Foul stench. Dirty creatures. <coughs> Get a good look, Alex. As you can bet your asteroids you'll be seeing more of them. Either you fight, or you get used to that smell. Look out, Alex! Centauri! Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Centauri. Are you okay? We're... <clears throat> Betty, get a doctor. No, no, no native cures or witch doctors. I'm fine. You know, it's a license to steal. It's a wonderful way to make a living. And uh, I, I wish the world could enjoy its job as much as I enjoy mine. Rita. Rita now. <laughs>